Hi there, it's Friday the 17th of April 2020. I'm Steve Towers. Welcome to ITB. Let's get started. As you know, the last ITB video was on the 3rd of April, which is two weeks ago. There are a number of important stories which emerged during the first week. I've included those stories in today's video, but to distinguish them from this week's stories, they're marked as catch-up stories. The OECD has issued further guidance in regard to the tax aspects of COVID-19. There are four items to note. Firstly, the OECD has released guidance which is called OECD Secretariat Analysis of Tax Treaties and the Impact of the COVID-19 Crisis. It considers several issues. Firstly, whether a PE will be created by the COVID-19 travel restrictions, either under Article 5.1 or Article 5.5. It also considers the impact on the measurement of time for the purposes of construction sites under Article 5.3. Secondly, the guidance discusses the impact on the resident status of a company in regard to the place of effective management tiebreaker test in Article 4.3. Thirdly, it looks at the impact on employees under Article 15. And finally, it considers the impact on the resident status of individuals. The second item of OECD guidance is called Tax Administration Responses to COVID-19, Business Continuity Considerations. It focuses on continuity plans for the tax administration itself. The third item of OECD guidance is called tax and fiscal policy in response to the coronavirus crisis, strengthening confidence and resilience. And the fourth item is an update of the OECD's database on tax policy measures which countries have taken in response to COVID-19. For a copy of these four items of guidance, please go to our website or app. The African Tax Administration Forum has issued two items of guidance in regard to COVID-19. The first is called Suggested COVID-19 Measures for Revenue Authorities and the second is called Mining Tax Policy Responses to COVID-19. For a copy of both of these documents, please go to our website or app. And in regard to substantive tax law changes by individual countries, I'll cover those changes later in this video. The OECD has issued Stage 2 peer review reports under BEPS Action 14 in regard to seven jurisdictions. For a copy of the reports, please go to our website or app. The OECD has published the comments it has received in regard to the public consultation document concerning reporting rules for platform operators. For a copy of the comments, please go to our website or app. And the OECD's Global Forum has issued peer review reports for eight jurisdictions in regard to transparency and exchange of information on request. For a copy of the reports, please go to our website or app. And in regard to digital taxation, Indonesia has introduced some important changes. I discuss that topic in the Asia-Pacific part of this video.
In Australia, the tax authorities have issued three items of guidance in regard to various aspects of tax depreciation. For a copy of the three items of guidance, please go to our website or app. In Indonesia, the government, in response to COVID-19, has fast-tracked some substantive tax changes which had been included in a tax reform bill introduced into Parliament earlier this year. It did so by issuing a regulation which is effective immediately. You'll remember that the tax reform bill proposed significant reductions in the corporate income tax rates, both the general rate and the special rate for certain publicly listed companies. Well, the regulation implements those reductions, but over a shorter time frame. According to the regulation, the general rate, which was 25% in 2019, will fall to 22% for 2020 and 2021, and then to 20% for 2022 and subsequent years. And the special rate for certain publicly listed companies, which was 20% in 2019, will fall to 19% for 2020 and 2021, and then to 17% for 2022 and subsequent years. The regulation also implements three tax changes in regard to digital transactions conducted by non-resident digital suppliers and marketplaces. The first change will require non-resident digital suppliers and marketplaces to register for and start charging VAT on inbound digital services. The second change is that for income tax purposes, a significant economic presence rule will apply to deem a permanent establishment to exist for non-resident digital suppliers and marketplaces. The regulation indicates that a significant economic presence will be determined according to three factors. The corporate group's consolidated turnover, total sales in Indonesia, and the number of active users in Indonesia. However, the regulation does not specify the thresholds for the three factors. Further guidance will be required. And the third change will apply if a double tax treaty prevents the significant economic presence rule from causing an income tax liability for the non-resident digital supplier or marketplace. In that situation, the non-resident digital supplier or marketplace will be subject to an electronic transaction tax. The regulation does not provide any further information about this new tax. For a copy of this regulation, please go to our website or app. Also in Indonesia, the government has responded to COVID-19 by providing a number of corporate tax relief measures, notably an exemption from the so-called Article 22 income tax on imports, a 30% reduction in monthly income tax instalments, and a preliminary refund of VAT over payments. All these measures are described in a regulation, PMK 23, issued by the Minister of Finance. For a copy of PMK 23, please go to our website or app. And also in Indonesia, the tax authorities have issued updated regulations in regard to APAs. The updated regulations include a number of taxpayer-friendly changes, including the ability to extend the term of the APA and to roll back the APA. For a copy of the updated regulations, please go to our website or app. In Japan, the government has announced corporate tax relief measures in response to COVID-19. As you would expect, the measures include tax payment deferral for corporate income tax and consumption tax. In regard to substantive tax changes, 
the most significant is the expansion of the tax loss carryback rules. Under current law, a one year tax loss carryback is available for companies with common share capital of 100 million yen, which is about 1 million US dollars or less, provided that they are not 100% owned directly or indirectly by a company with common share capital of 500 million yen, which is about 5 million US dollars or more. Well, the proposed expansion will see all of these financial amounts increase. It will be available for companies with common share capital of 1 billion yen, which is about 10 million US dollars or less, provided that they are not 100% owned directly or indirectly by a company with common share capital of 1 billion yen or more. The expansion will allow a one year carry back for a tax loss incurred in a tax year which ends between the 1st of February 2020 and the 31st of January 2022. The proposed tax measures also provide qualifying SMEs with property tax reductions and enhanced tax depreciation for so-called telework-related investments. For a copy of the government's announcement, please go to our website or app. There has been a further development in regard to the indirect share transfer dispute in Nepal, which concerns Axiata. I've covered this topic several times in ITB most recently on the 10th of January. Here's a quick reminder. The dispute concerns NCEL Private Limited, a Nepalese company which operates a mobile phone network in Nepal. 80% of the shares in NCEL are owned by a company called Reynolds Holdings Limited, which is incorporated in St Kitts and Nevis. Reynolds was a 100% subsidiary of a Norwegian company within the Telia Group, which is headquartered in Sweden. The Norwegian company sold all the shares in Reynolds to Axiata Investments UK Limited, a UK subsidiary of Axiata, which is headquartered in Malaysia. The Nepalese tax authorities initially pursued the Telia Norwegian company for capital gains tax on the sale of the shares in Reynolds. However, the Nepalese tax authorities then looked to NCEL itself to pay the asserted tax liability, which is the equivalent of 180 million US dollars plus interest. Well, Axiata has now announced to the Malaysian Stock Exchange that it has fully paid the asserted tax liability plus interest, but it has done so under protest and expressly without prejudice to NCEL and Axiata UK's position in the international arbitration proceedings under the 1993 Nepal-UK Investment Protection Treaty. For a copy of Axiata's announcement, please go to our website or app. In New Zealand, as a response to COVID-19, the government has proposed changes to the company tax loss rules, specifically a temporary tax loss carryback scheme, a permanent tax loss carryback scheme, and a relaxation of the existing tax loss continuity rules. Public consultation will occur on the three initiatives, with the first initiative, the temporary tax loss carryback scheme, to be included in a bill to be introduced into Parliament in the week commencing the 27th of April. For a copy of the government's announcement, please go to our website or app. In Sri Lanka, the tax authorities have issued an updated version of guidance on proposed amendments to be made to the income tax law. I covered the original guidance in ITB on the 28th of February. The updated guidance makes one very interesting change. The reduced income tax rate of 14% will now apply to gains and profits 
from conducting a business of sale of goods or merchandise where the payment for such sale is received in foreign currency and remitted through a bank to Sri Lanka. For a copy of the updated guidance, please go to our website or app. In Vietnam, the Ministry of Finance has proposed two important tax changes. Firstly, it has proposed that the current cap on deductible interest, which is set at 20% of EBITDA, be increased to 30% of EBITDA. And secondly, it has proposed that the introduction of compulsory electronic invoicing be deferred from the 1st of November 2020 to the 1st of July 2022. Estonia has become the latest EU member state to harmonise the VAT rate for electronic publications and their paper equivalents. Accordingly, the 9% reduced VAT rate will apply for e-publications instead of the 20% standard rate. The implementation date has not yet been confirmed. The European Commission has proposed a second extension of the scope of the State Aid Temporary Framework, which was originally adopted on the 19th of March and first extended on the 3rd of April. The proposed second extension would allow member states to provide recapitalizations to companies in need. For a copy of the Commission's press release on this topic, please go to our website or app. In Finland, the Supreme Administrative Court has decided a transfer pricing case in regard to the operation of a captive finance company. The Finnish parent company of a group originally owned a portfolio of intra-group receivables, interest-bearing loans which had been made to operating subsidiaries in the group the group parent company established a finance company in Belgium and transferred the portfolio of intra-group receivables to the finance company in consideration for the issue of shares by the finance company. The finance company had relatively small liabilities. It was funded predominantly by the shares issued to the group parent company. The finance company therefore derives significant interest income from the intra-group receivables. However, in recognition of the fact that the functions related to intra-group financing were shared between the group parent company and the finance company, two years later the two companies entered into an agreement which provides the finance company with a targeted return. If the finance company's income exceeds the target, the excess is paid by the finance company to the group parent company. Alternatively, if the finance company's income is less than the target, the group parent company pays the shortfall to the finance company. The tax authorities claimed that all of the significant functions related to intra-group financing were actually being performed by the parent company and that the finance company actually performed only administrative functions. The tax authorities therefore determined that the finance company should receive a return which reflects the performance of administrative functions, with the residual being allocated to the group parent company. An important aspect of this case is that the relevant tax years were 2011 and 2012. That meant that the relevant version of the OECD transfer pricing guidelines was the 2010 version. That's important because the 2010 version describes only two situations where, exceptionally, the tax authorities may disregard the structure adopted by a taxpayer in entering into a control transaction. Also, the discussion of the accurately delineated transaction, which is deduced from written contracts and the conduct of the parties, is in the 2017 version, 
but not 2010. And I think that for that reason, the court concluded that the written agreement between the two companies must be respected and that accordingly, the finance company cannot be treated on the basis that it performs only administrative functions. And so the court decided in favour of the taxpayer. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. You'll remember that in response to COVID-19, various European countries have agreed to relax the time limitations which apply to cross-border workers. Germany has recently made two such agreements, one with the Netherlands and the other with Luxembourg. For information on the two agreements, please go to our website or app. In Hungary, the government has announced two special tax increases to raise revenue to fund its COVID-19 response. The first is a one-off increase in the rate of bank tax. The increase is set at 0.19% of the total assets exceeding 50 billion Hungarian forints, which is about 139 million euros. And the second is a special tax on the retail sector imposed according to a progressive rate scale. You'll remember that the European Court of Justice has recently decided that the progressive rate scale of Hungary's former special tax on the retail sector is not discriminatory. In Ireland, the tax authorities have announced that the most favoured nation clause in the Ireland-Lithuania Treaty in regard to royalties has been triggered by the Japan-Lithuania Treaty. For a copy of the announcement, please go to our website or app. In the Netherlands, the Parliament's Advisory Committee on the Taxation of Multinationals has issued a report which recommends that the government reduce deductions for multinationals in respect of shareholder costs, interest and royalties. The report also recommends that the deduction of carry-forward tax losses be capped at 50% of profits exceeding 1 million euros. For a copy of the report, please go to our website or app. In Russia, you'll remember that the government has recently announced its intention of amending its double tax treaties to allow a 15% dividend and interest withholding tax to apply. Cyprus was the first country contacted by Russia for negotiations. The government has now indicated that it has sent letters to both Luxembourg and Malta for a similar purpose. For a copy of the Russian government statement, please go to our website or app. In Switzerland, the government has launched a consultation in regard to proposed changes to interest withholding tax, including a proposal to exempt domestic legal entities and foreign investors from withholding tax on interest-bearing investments. The government notes this will enable corporate groups to issue their bonds in Switzerland without withholding tax hurdles. For a copy of the government statement, please go to our website or app. In the UK, the tax authorities have issued guidance in regard to the impact of COVID-19 travel restrictions on corporate tax residents and PE status. The guidance adopts a reassuring tone without giving a definitive assurance that central management and control or PE status will not be found to exist in the UK. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. Also in the UK, the Upper Tribunal has allowed the tax authorities appeal in the Gardarsen case, which I discussed in ITB last year. The case concerns the characterisation for VAT purposes of a physical diary called an Action Day Planner. The first tier tribunal decided last year that the diary should be characterised as a book, which is zero rated, instead of unused stationery, which is not. The upper tribunal has now decided that the diary is not a book. 
For a copy of the Upper Tribunal's decision, please go to our website or app. In Kenya, the Tax Appeals Tribunal has decided a VAT case in regard to so-called interchange fees paid by one bank to another. The taxpayer in the case is shown here as the cardholder's bank. It had issued a credit card to a customer, the cardholder. That cardholder acquires goods or services from a merchant and uses the credit card to pay the price. The merchant's bank makes an inquiry with the cardholder's bank to verify that the cardholder has sufficient funds for the purchase. A verification is sent by the cardholder's bank to the merchant's bank. The merchant's bank pays a fee, called an interchange fee, for the verification. The issue in the case is the VAT treatment of the verification service which is provided by the cardholder's bank. The tribunal held that the verification service is a service provided by the cardholder's bank to the cardholder and not to the merchant's bank. It also held that the service is a money transfer related service, which is an exempt service under the VAT Act. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. And Kenya's Tax Appeals Tribunal has decided another VAT case, this one in regard to a possible missing trader fraud. The taxpayer company purchased goods from several suppliers who charged VAT on their sales. The suppliers issued to the taxpayer company VAT invoices which correctly recorded the sales transactions and the VAT. However, the suppliers did not forward their VAT liabilities to the tax authorities, which suspected that the suppliers were engaged in missing trader fraud. Nevertheless, the taxpayer company claimed input tax credits for the VAT it has paid to the suppliers. That claim was denied by the tax authorities due to the suspected missing trader fraud. However, the tribunal held that the taxpayer was entitled to the input tax credits. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In South Africa, the tax authorities have issued, for public comment, draft guidance in regard to the VAT treatment of points-based loyalty programs. Public comments are requested by the 30th of June. For a copy of the draft guidance, please go to our website or app. And also in South Africa, the Supreme Court of Appeal has decided a VAT case in regard to a provision which deems a single supply to be two separate supplies. The taxpayer company is a distributor of branded alcoholic beverages. It entered into a contract with the non-resident brand owners for the performance of advertising and promotional services in South Africa. Those services consisted of two elements. Firstly, the performance of advertising and marketing activities, such as the placement of advertisements in various media, website design and build, social networks, and sponsorship of sports events. The second element was the giveaway of goods to customers and others in South Africa, for example, alcoholic beverages and branded glasses, shirts and caps. It was left to the discretion of the taxpayer company as to how much of the budget was spent on each of the two elements. Under the contract, the fee was set at the cost incurred by the taxpayer company in performing the services. Importantly, the contract did not set out any separate consideration for each of the two elements, and neither did the taxpayer company's invoices. They merely showed a single fee for the performance of the services. 
The taxpayer company treated the services as zero rated for VAT purposes on the basis that the services were supplied to non-residents. However, the tax authorities claimed that the services should be bifurcated for VAT purposes into their two elements, with the zero rate applying to the advertising and marketing activities and the standard rate applying to the promotional giveaways. The claimed bifurcation was based on a deeming provision in the VAT Act, Section 815, which I've set out here. Please hit the pause button to study this provision. And the court agreed with the tax authorities. In doing so, the court stated that cases in Europe and New Zealand were not relevant because of the presence of Section 815 in the South African legislation. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In Bahrain, the tax authorities have issued guidance on MAP. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. In the UAE, the government has issued guidance which indicates that UAE entities must adopt a substance over form approach in determining the applicability of the country's economic substance requirements. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. In Brazil, the tax authorities have issued guidance that payments for the use of software fall within the definition of royalties in Article 12 of the Austria-Brazil Treaty. That definition is very similar to the corresponding definition in the UN Model Treaty. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. In the US, Treasury and the IRS have issued final and proposed regulations in regard to hybrid mismatches, dual consolidated losses and conduit financing. For a copy of the two sets of regulations, please go to our website or app. Also in the US, the IRS has issued several items of guidance in regard to aspects of the CARES Act, which was recently enacted. I noted two items in particular, Revenue Procedure 22 in regard to the interest expense limitation under Section 163J, and Revenue Procedure 24 in regard to the tax loss carryback measures. For a copy of both of these documents, please go to our website or app. And also in the US, the IRS has issued guidance in the form of FAQs on transfer pricing documentation. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. And now for this week's treaty developments. We've had two treaties enter into force and one protocol enter into force. I have two items for you this week. The first item is an article called Global Tax Planning for Strange Days. It's written by Ken Brewer and it's published in Tax Notes Today International. This article is written from the viewpoint of US multinationals which are currently incurring tax losses due to COVID-19. The article is mainly focused on US tax loss utilisation strategies, but it also briefly considers tax loss utilisation strategies in other countries. For US multinationals, it provides a good catalogue of issues to consider.
The second item I have for you is actually a series of seven articles dealing with the impact of COVID-19 on transfer pricing. The articles are all written by professionals from Baker McKenzie and they're published in Bloomberg BNA's Tax Management International Journal. Here are the titles for the first four of the articles. Please hit the pause button if you'd like to study this list. And here are the titles for the other three of the articles. Please hit the pause button to study the list. Well, that's the way it is this Friday, the 17th of April, 2020. I'm Steve Towers. Have a great weekend.